Well, I was, uh, I was having lunch with my grandson, Ethan, the other day. I picked him up from, from school about around noon. And uh, so as we were sitting at the table, he said, So uh, what are you doing this afternoon, Grandpa? And I said, uh, I'm, I'm working on my sermon for Sunday. And he said, how do you do that? <laughs> like, do you follow a model? Or do you, uh, how do you know what to preach? And I laughed and I said, funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, I said, sometimes we preach on a series through a book of the Bible, like um, Uncle Nathan and I, have, we preach through the book of Revelation, and then we did through Luke Acts. And sometimes we preach a series on a theme, like from a book, the the Epic of Eden that we did the early part of the year, and now we're doing a theme on uh, what does love look like. I said, but this week I'm, I'm taking a risk to do something different. It's kind of like driving down the highway, and all of a sudden you drive off the road with a 4 by 4 And I said, very early this week, I don't know if it was Sunday night or Monday night, um, I heard these words in my sleep, strong and clear and persistent, and the words were, this will end. And those words stayed with me until until I woke up, and they stayed with me through the day. And he said, this will end? What does that mean? And I said, I don't know. (laughs) But it seemed to be the voice of the Lord, and I think he wanted me to search him out and to learn more. So that's what I've been doing all week, just listening for more. And now I'm ready to write down the different thoughts that have been coming to me through the week. Uh, This is just kind of an aside. I want to remind you of something that we learned from Paul Cain a number of years ago when he was here in Edmonton. He says, I want to share with you in five minutes what it took me 50 years to learn. He says, first of all, you get revelation from the Lord. And the second step is to ask for illumination. He says, too many people get a revelation from the Lord and they just tell people about their crazy visions and dreams and nobody knows what it means. He says, you ask for, revela- for, for illumination. So what does this mean? And finally, when you have some understanding of what it means, then you ask for application. Like, what do I do with this? So then I, <clears throat> I shared a little bit more with, uh, with Ethan. I said, it occurred to me as I was meditating this week that... People usually want to know if something will end when they're in the midst of suffering. Suffering, especially intense suffering, seems to have an eternal-like quality about it. You can't remember what it was ever like not to suffer, and it seems like the suffering will never end. Does this resonate with anybody? A few of you. (laughs) So you understand what I'm talking about. And you can identify with this. Who among us is suffering right now? Physically, mentally, emotionally? Quite a few. Okay. It occurred to me that if this were truly a word from the Lord, and we take hope, this will end, it would speak to a lot of people going through intense suffering or who will be going through intense suffering in the near future. And that he will confirm that word with some attending signs where suffering will be abruptly ended. That'd be nice. You know, I think he's actually been doing that. I don't know if you remember two or three months ago, John Koslick and I were sitting up here in front and, and you prayed for us. And one of the prayers for John Koslick was that, that he would not experience pain from the bone cancer that had developed in his body because of the prostate cancer. And the latest report I heard is that he is still not experiencing any pain. The Lord said, this will end. And then I also understand that last Sunday when we had a a river of water going up here, that uh, there was something about if you would step into the river right now at 1117, 
that there would be some healing. Who would, who would, who would experience that? Do you want to, can you share with us just briefly what happened to you? <clears throat> you don't mind, do you? Okay, thank you. I'm just sorry I didn't say something sooner. Um, if you were here last week, you saw a, a big blue long cloth here, and the children were dancing on it. And uh, I had taken a very serious tumble down my stairs on Saturday and um, got a massive bruise on my back, and my knee went right, right out. I'm pretty sure I tore a ligament <laughs> at the time. And so I'm still wearing a brace um, more to protect it from, um, you know, because it's still weak. But the Lord just said, step out and go walk in the river. I'm here. So I came and as soon as I, literally, as soon as I stepped out into the aisle there, all the pain in my knee just disappeared. I walked up here and my sister here had prayed for me just before we had come into the sanctuary. And as soon as I stepped onto that river, I could feel the ligament go back where it belonged, um, right, right along the side here. And all the, the swelling from my knee just was reduced down to a minimum. And I got a 90% healing. And when I asked the Lord about the 90% healing, he said, according to your faith, it be done to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's really cool. <clears throat> Does anybody happen to remember what song we were singing when that happened? Karis, do you remember? Oh, I guess she's not here. She's Sunday school. Is that whole thing about call me out on the water? <laughs> yes, there you go. That was the one. Um, <clears throat> I, I just, I'm taking some risk here. I, I asked the Lord to, to give me some words of knowledge. And uh, <laughs> there's a thing about getting words of knowledge where we say, if you... Uh, um, if you experience a pain in your body that you know is not yours, then it's probably for someone else. And uh, I've never had that experience because everything hurts. <laughs> so I say, could you kind of give me a picture? The first picture that I got is someone with pain in their right foot. Does anybody identify with that? A significant pain in the right foot. Okay. Could you just... Uh, People, would you just gather around, uh, around her right now and just begin to, to pray? Lord, we, we just say right now, this will end. This will end. We stop this pain. We break it off in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that in the name of Jesus we have authority over affliction and disease. Father, we thank you for the hope that you impart to us. <clears throat> some things happen suddenly. Some things happen gradually. We, we want to hear a report from you. Okay. <laughs> More than an hour later. Okay. Um, I also got uh, something about a right knee. Does anybody have pain in the right knee? Back here. Okay. Would you just gather around Bonnie? Just lay hands on her. The body of Christ now gathers around you to minister to you the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. We take authority over the pain, the affliction in that right knee, and we say this will end right now. Stop it. We break off that pain. We break off the affliction in the name of Jesus, and we command healing. We command comfort to come. Lord, import, impart hope to your people. Your word. We had a scripture in pre-service prayer about comfort, comfort ye my people. And so I'd like to pray for those who have a pain in your heart, a broken heart, a hurting heart. Anybody? No, we don't have anybody. If you're, if you're there, just stand up. And then there are quite a few who have a hurting heart. And let's gather around them and pray because Lord um, let me get my Bible C could you hand me my Bible
thank you in my purse. I'm at that stage where I need my glasses. And Lord, I thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted and that you saved and you save the crushed in spirit. And your word to your people is comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sin. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places shall become a plain. And may the glory of the Lord be revealed in your life, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we cover your broken heart with the blood of Jesus, where sin has caused it, perhaps sin against you, or your own sinful reaction. We just cover your broken heart with the blood of Jesus. Grief, loss, just this achiness in your heart. We just cover you with the blood. The blood is enough. And Lord, come with your Holy Spirit of comfort and lift off this deep, deep pain. Lord, lift off the deep, deep pain. Absorb it into yourself. Because the Lord's heart is broken for the same thing your heart is broken for. He, his heart is broken. He weeps over what you're weeping. Yes, yes, that's the Lord. He's crying about what you're crying about. The tears, just take the tears, Lord. Come, Lord, hold and carry your people. Carry your little lambs. <laughs> Where this is just too much for them. It's just too much. So the Lord picks you up and he carries you. And he kisses you on the forehead and he comforts you. And he says, I'm there for you, brother. I'm there for you, sister. I love you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And what concerns you concerns me. But don't forget the word of the Lord. Is my arm too short that I cannot heal, that I cannot deliver? No, says the Lord. My arm is not too short that I cannot heal, that I cannot deliver. So, Lord, come. Come. Just let your spirit wash over. Let your spirit wash over. Absorb the grief. Absorb it, Lord. Comfort, comfort your people, Jesus. Comfort, comfort. Without measure. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Wash over us with your love. Mm. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. He cares about you. He speaks tenderly to you. He holds you in his arms of love and compassion and mercy. That's Jesus. Mm. A kiss from the Father to you today in his name. And we speak this specific word of the Lord over you right now. Take heart, take hope. This will end. This suffering, this pain will not last forever. <clears throat> so this is a now word for those who feel like they're barely hanging on. 
I love what Mother Basile Schlink said when she was still alive. She says, suffering is never the final outcome. <clears throat> Not long ago, I was speaking to some young men who have been meeting with my wife Ruth every Saturday morning for spiritual formation and uh, asked them how it was going. And uh, they said, we had no idea how much the Bible talks about suffering. And indeed, it does from cover to cover. The suffering of all mankind because of sin, the suffering of the children of Israel, the unspeakable sufferings of, the Je of Jesus the Messiah, the sufferings of all the apostles and prophets, and even the suffering of all who follow Jesus and serve him, Lord. That's really kind of how the book ends, just before Jesus breaks in. Amazingly, Today, in our world, the most hated and persecuted people are those who call Jesus Lord. Some of the worst suffering is being endured by Christians. For example, if you're a Christian refugee, no country will take you, including Canada and the United States. According to the international press, Christian refugees have no place to go. I just read an article in Faith Magazine entitled, No Room in the Inn. So the day of which, of which Jesus spoke when he said, you will be hated by all for my name's sake is now upon us. I also see that this word has application for the very near future. For all of us, take hope. This will end to assure us that God himself, the almighty God, the creator God, the God of the universe, God is in charge of the timeline. Not our enemies, not the devil, and not dumb fate. I don't know if you've noticed that the scripture readings for the first two Sundays of Advent we're speaking about judgment and speaking about the end of the world. And it in, all involves suffering. Tribulation is the word, or great tribulation. When Jesus talks about things, the kind of things that we're seeing now, for example, wars and rumors of wars, nation, ri nation, nation rising against nation, meaning ethnic group rising against ethnic group, ethnic genocide like the Hutus and the Tutsis, the Shiites versus the Sunnis, famines, earthquakes. He says, these are but the beginning. These are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Birth pains. How many here actually know what birth pains are? Men, keep your hand down. <laughs> you have no idea, okay. When he says the beginning of the birth pains, that's when she says, honey, I think I might be starting labor. That's the beginning of the birth pains. Jesus says that in the end, we're all going to go through something that looks a lot like labor and delivery without anesthesia. How many of you have the t-shirt, I survived labor and delivery? <laughs> Women, you can put your hands up again. <laughs> I think that for most women, childbirth is a transforming experience. It's not like, like after you've gone through it once, you're never the same again. Now, in the midst of the birthing experience, at least some say, I can't do this. I changed my mind. Can we stop now? <laughs> but the process carries on to the very end, whether we want it to or not. And when we've come through delivery, we see ourselves differently. I did that. I did that. <laughs> I wasn't sure I could, but I did that. I gave birth. Like I said, there's something about that kind of suffering that transforms you forever. Now concerning the coming birth pains that we will all go through, men and women, there is a word of hope 
in Matthew 24 that literally needs to be stored up, I think, for the days to come. It's about the end of the birth pains. The end of the birth pains. Matthew 24, 21. There will be great tribulation such as, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who's he talking about? The elect. Who are the elect? You are the elect, the chosen ones in Christ. For your sake, he will not allow you to suffer beyond your ability to endure, which you don't actually know what that is, but he does. He himself will step in and say, this will end now. Now, why is it so important to say this? It's because we live in a culture that for the most part is utterly humanistic to the core. Meaning that man is the center of all things. Man believes that he is the cause of all things and only man can be the savior and the solution of all things. For example, since it's in the current news, all climate change is man caused. And only man can solve the problem and save the planet. Which involves two things, cutting CO2 emissions to a very low level and reducing the population of the world to 500 million people. If you think there are no plans to do that, you don't read the real news. <laughs> there is no God there is no God who can or will save us. We must save ourselves. Have you never read the Humanist Manifesto? It's all based on the premise that there is no God. Count God out of the picture. And there is currently a conscious campaign to make it so. And it's not just about not saying the word Christmas anymore. No, in stark contrast to all this human bravado, the scripture teaches that the end of the world and the salvation of the world depends on God and the divine timing of God himself. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, that is to all ethnic groups, and then, and then the end will come. Not only is there a God who is fully in control of all things, but through Jesus and his indwelling spirit, we have a loving Father who holds us very close to his heart, and he makes his plan known to us. Creator God, the God of angel armies, knows about climate change. Isn't that amazing? And he knows about shifting tectonic plates. He's like really, really smart. He stands above the weather, and he actually foresaw thousands of years ago famines and earthquakes just before the onset of labor when all creation will groan and travail for the birth of God's new creation. And he has ordained the day and the hour when the great tribulation, the birthing of the new creation, decisively ends, and he knows how it's going to end. The Son of God will appear suddenly, like lightning flashing from east to west. I was listening to Rick Joyner's uh, latest video on prophetic perspectives this week. And he was talking about San Bernardino, about ISIS on American soil, and the possibility of Christian martyrdom. And then he talked about being fearless in the face of suffering and death. And he says, I don't have to be afraid because I'm already dead. He says, what can you do to a dead man? I've died with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I've been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. 
And he says, I stand now in the hope of the resurrection every day. I need to fear nothing, not suffering and not death. And then he said, through suffering, God is enlarging our capacity for heaven. It's for something. Suffering looks forward to eternity. Suffering prepares us for what is to come. And what is to come is much bigger than what is. Do you believe that? That suffering actually enlarges your capacity for heaven? Well, what does the word say? Romans 5, starting at verse 3. Moreover, we rejoice in our sufferings. We don't re rejoice because we like to suffer. We rejoice because we know what suffering produces. Suffering produces endurance. I don't know if you've been listening to uh, my son Nathan lately, but he's been out bow hunting for moose this fall. And he talks about when he first started that it nearly killed him. <laughs> That he didn't, he wasn't even sure he could survive it, you know, always out of breath, you know, your heart pounding and that sort of thing. But he kept at it for a couple of months until as the season was ending, he says, I can go out there stomping through that tall bush for hours and not even get tired. Suffering produces endurance. And he's finally come to that place where he has great in, <coughs> endurance. And then the word says, and endurance produces character. You ever notice that people who have developed character are people who are willing to suffer for some higher good? There are some parents who suffer tremendously for their own children to make sure that they get a good education so they can get a job and support a family. There are people who suffer incredibly in order to plant churches. That's why not very many people plant churches. <laughs> it requires a lot from people in order to do that. Suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and that hope doesn't disappoint us. The other night at the Edmonton Vineyard uh, pastor's Christmas potluck, um, we had a chance to hear Pastor Wade Thomas share with us his experience of nine years in the military. Uh, there aren't very many pastors that can do that. Not many pastors have that kind of experience. And so it was, it was a very rich opportunity to get an inside look. And during military training, he, he encountered suffering beyond imagination. How many of you have gone through the military, gone through military training? One person. He's a survivor. <laughs> he, talked about, he talked about one week in training when their whole company was only allowed a total of five hours sleep. There's 168 hours in a week. They were only allowed a total of five hours of sleep. You know what happens when you get sleep deprived? You go nuts, you go psychotic. You know, you hallucinate and stuff like that. He, he talked about men marching in their sleep. You know, hours later, they would wake up, you know, and didn't know how they got there and that sort of thing. He talked about men driving trucks and jeeps in their sleep and running over the trenches of their mates in their sleep. And then he said, we knew that they knew that we could never make it. They knew that we would fail. As a matter of fact, the whole exercise was calculated to make sure that we failed. We knew that they knew that we could get injured or killed. The whole thing was designed to make sure that we failed. And yet, when it was all over, we knew that we had done something we never thought possible. They were transformed by the suffering. They were transformed by being pushed over the edge. It's people that go through that kind of training 
who will face dangerous things, injury and even death, to protect and defend us because they've come so close and they've actually come through it. Those are the people that we can actually trust with that kind of responsibility. Now, can you, can you apply the analogy and make the spiritual application? Think about the people that you can actually trust in the body of Christ. And why would you trust them? What prepared them to be so trustworthy? Suffering enlarges our capacity for heaven and it enlarges our capacity for heaven on earth. <clears throat> I've been encouraging you to continuously read the scriptures or listen to the daily audio Bible, those kind of things. One of the main reasons to continuously read through the scriptures or listen to others read it to you is to become acquainted with the ways of God. The Bible says the children of Israel knew the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. For example, Joseph is a slave in Egypt for 14 years. And suddenly, in a day, God elevates him to the throne of Egypt. One day, God said, this will end. Israel is a slave nation in Egypt for 400 years and suddenly in a day, in a day, she is released from her slavery to head for the land promised to Abraham and his seed. Judah goes into captivity in Babylon for 70 years but in one day is released to return to the promised land. Sometimes it goes a little differently. John the Baptist is imprisoned by King Herod, but is suddenly dispatched to heaven by the executioner's acts in a way and a time that even Herod couldn't foresee. Jesus, at the height of his ministry, at the height of his ministry, is arrested, tried, persecuted, and put to death on a cross. But suddenly, on the first day of the week, God the Father raises him from the dead in total triumph over sin, Satan, death, and the grave in a day. You see, it is God the Father who set the hour for his death. God the Father who set the hour for his resurrection. God the Father who set the hour for his ascension into heaven. And it was God the Father who has already set the day and the hour for his victorious return. According to the ways of God, right now, you are somewhere along that spectrum. And so am I. And even if you are in the midst of suffering right now that feels eternal and unbearable, take hope. Because God is enlarging your capacity for heaven. And this will and the Lord not only determines the time for things to begin, he is the beginning. He not only determines the time for things to end, he is the end. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And not only does he set the time for the consummation of all of his promises, he is the consummation. He is the fulfillment. He is the goal. He is the prize. Let me pray. <clears throat> Father, once again, we ask that you would bring your comfort. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our sufferings, all of our afflictions, so that we might comfort others in their afflictions with the same comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. Father, we give our hearts 
to you this day in utter trust and confidence and say, we do trust you. We do trust your timing. We trust your wisdom. And we trust all the things that you're working out in our life to enlarge our capacity for heaven and for heaven on earth. Blessed Holy Spirit, Spirit of all comfort, rest upon us, rest upon your people. And Lord, set us free from all of the anxieties of the world, all the lies that the world believes. That all we have is ourselves and we have to save ourselves, defend ourselves, protect ourselves, deliver ourselves. And Father, we thank you for the assurance that every suffering that we're going through now or ever will go through will end because you will end it with eternal triumph and victory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.